All right, if you would take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. John, chapter 14. We're going to look at one verse today. John, chapter 14. We're going to look at verse number 6. And the title for today's message is this, An Inconvenient Truth. John chapter 14, verse number 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you this morning, I pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up. And I pray we put everything aside and focus on worshiping you. Give me only the words that you would have me to say, nothing more. I pray now that you will bless our time as we look into your word. In Christ's name, amen. Again, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I, like I said, I titled this an inconvenient truth. That may sound like a little strange topic for a title, say it's inconvenient. But the truth is, the word inconvenient means it's untimely, or it doesn't meet someone's needs or purposes. So the truth is something that's kind of funny. Sometimes the truth can be inconvenient. Now we know all about the truth. We say we want to hear the truth, but you know what? The truth is that the truth can be manipulated. It can be massaged. It can be stretched. We have half-truths, we have some truths, and then we have the absolute truth. And there's a difference. Now, we say we want to hear the truth, but there are times I have to say the truth is not convenient. It's inconvenient when we hear it. Jesus says here, he is the truth. And I can tell you right now, the truth is inconvenient to Satan. Satan does not like the truth. He doesn't want the truth to get out. He will do everything he can to suppress the truth. And he has a lot of different tactics. And that's why the truth has become so convoluted. So Satan will try things like saying the truth is subjective. What's true for you may not be true for me. It's a matter of your perspective, if you will. Okay? Well, there are some things that may be true for me that aren't true for you. For example, I get a flu shot, guess what? I get the flu. That's true for me, but that may not be true for you. I know a lot of people that get flu shots that never get sick. But the fact is, I get sick from flu shots. I get the flu. That's true for me, but not true for you. But that doesn't make it a fact. That's the difference. Absolute truth is a fact. It's true for everybody. Not just you, not just you, but for me as well. And there would be some that would say, well, the truth hurts. So I don't want to hear the truth. That's where we get into this idea of it being inconvenient. We said we want to hear the truth, but we really don't. We like to massage the truth, right? Anybody here fish? Then you've all massaged the truth at one point or another. I'll just be honest with you. I know that little sardine you caught turned into a 140 pound monster catfish that fell off the hook, so there's no record. You've massaged the truth at some point. And I know you golfers have done the same thing. That thing that was sitting on the lip, that you was a 30 foot putt somehow, it got in there. You hit it and you put it in the cup, but you kind of massaged the distance a little bit, right? And we like to say we want to hear the truth, but ladies, you put us gentlemen in bad spots because you do not want to hear the truth. How many of you have done this? You've gone up to your husband and said, 
Honey, am I fat? You don't want to know the truth, and we are not willing to go out there and get ourselves killed in our sleep to tell you the truth, right? <laughs> That's the thing. The truth can be corrupted. I remember one time my wife asked me this question. She said, does this dress make me look fat? But I did not lie. I said, no, that dress does not make you look fat. <laughs> That cheeseburger you ate with those fries may have, but the dress didn't, right? But that's the thing. But we want the truth, but the thing is, we don't always want to really hear the truth, because the truth can hurt. The truth can step on your toes. I will tell you here today, when my wife and I started seeing each other before we were married, her mother was there, and it's like, I was a little bit lighter than I am today. And I'm not talking about skin color, I'm talking about weight-wise. I was about 30, 40 pounds lighter, but I was still fat. You see, I admit, I was fat, okay? But she would say, you're not fat, you're plump. <laughs> she was trying to say it nicely, because she thought the truth would offend me. But here's the thing, I've never been worried about that. When I was in the Navy, I transferred commands, and I got to my new command, and the first thing my division officer said to me is that, Petty Officer Green, I see you have a weight problem. What are you doing about it? And so I responded, I'm buying bigger clothes. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm fat, I know it. I'm not trying to hide it. <clears throat> but sometimes when we hear the truth, it hurts. Satan finds the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ being inconvenient because it doesn't meet his purposes, doesn't meet his needs. And what he wants is to rule and to reign. That's his, been his ultimate goal from the beginning, to replace God. And that's what he still believes that he's going to do. And so what he will do is try to get the truth denied. He'll try to mislead. He'll try to do all these different things to get people stray from the truth. To get them pointed away from Jesus Christ. And he's used a lot of different weapons. One of his biggest weapons is religion. There are a lot of people that come out there and knock on your doors. And they say they have the truth. When they're spreading lies. There are people that sit out here. And I've seen it. I've seen the signs. The truth from the word of God when they're spreading lies. And there's different religions that will tell you there are all these ways to heaven. And we'll get into that a little bit more and a little, a little bit later. But they'll give you all these ideas trying to muddy the water about the truth. They will try to give you different translations and different versions of the word of God. And say, these are all the true word of God. But be very careful about what you read. Because some translations are not cracked up, or not what they're cracked up to be, put it that way. And I can tell you this, when you open up one book and it says one thing, and you open up another Bible, and it says something completely opposite, and it's the same verse, one of them is true and one of them is false. Better be careful. That's all I'll say on that. But when we start, Satan will try to tell you, this word is outdated. This word is not true because it was written by man. And man is flawed. And if man is flawed, then his word cannot be true. It must be flawed as well. Well, we here at Journey Baptist hold to the fact that this book is the inerrant, infallible word of God. It is true from Genesis through Revelation. There are no errors found in this book. There are no mistakes. And it is 100% true. Was it written by man? Absolutely. But it's inspired by God. Man wrote the words that God gave to him. And that's the truth. And Jesus said, I am the truth. Well, Jesus was the living word. And this book is a living book, and it is the Word of God. It represents the Lord Jesus Christ here. And everything here points to the truth 
the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I say to you very kindly, if there's one word in this book that is untrue, then the whole book becomes worthless. Because how do you know what's true and what's not? So that's where Satan wants to get you. He wants to tell you that the book is not true. There are different versions of the truth. And he will say to you, he will say to me, and this appeals to the flesh, he will say, the truth is what you want the truth to be. See, your truth is your truth, but my truth is my truth. And he says, you have to accept my truth as true, but I don't have to accept yours. That's nothing more than a lie. You see, if it's true for some, but not true for all, it's not a fact, and it's not absolute truth. It's misleading. But Jesus said, I am the truth. So today, we are going to look at some inconvenient truth. And we're going to start with the fact that Jesus says, number one, Jesus is the truth. That is an absolute. That's true for you. That's true for you. That's true for me. That's true for all. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now understand, if we're going to understand what Jesus means by truth, we have to understand what the word means. And the word from the Greek means that there's no pretense there. There's no lies, no deceit. It is a fact. It is a certainty. In other words, it's an absolute. It's an absolute. And there are certain things that are absolute. For one, if you do not have air to breathe, you will die. That's true for everybody, right? If you don't have water, you won't survive. If you don't have food, nourishment, you won't survive. These are absolute truths. My children think if they don't have a cell phone, they will die. That is not true. It's not. It's an inconvenience to them. My daughter called me yesterday and she said, the air conditioning in my car is not working. I'm going to die. No, you're not. You're going to sweat. I know it's hot. It's South Carolina. I drove around this place for 10 years without air conditioning. You can get through it for a few minutes, okay? You'll survive. Truth matters. It should be important. But Jesus said, I am the truth. There is no doubt. There is no deceit. There is no pretense. I am the truth. But what's he the truth about? He said, I am the way. The way. He is the way to eternal life because he said, I am the life. And he said, no man cometh to the Father but by me. So the truth of the matter is, the fact of the matter is, he is the way to eternal life with God the Father. There is no other way. Satan will try to tell you there are multiple ways to heaven. That's a lie. Other religions will tell you there are other ways to heaven apart from Jesus Christ. That's a lie. There's this idea, if you do enough good works, they outweigh the bad, that'll get you to heaven. If you put enough money in the plate, that will get you to heaven. Just by coming and having your name on the membership rolls at the church will get you to heaven. Being up in the baptismal pool and getting dunked in the water will get you to heaven. If you knock on enough doors, that will get you to heaven. If you crawl on your hands and knees through broken glass for a half a mile or more, that will get you to heaven. There's all these ideas about what will get you to heaven. Let me tell you very kindly here today, the truth. 
Jesus said, I am the way. The way. And uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Jesus is saying, if you want to get to heaven, I'm here knocking at the door. Just open the door and invite me in. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, he's knocking at the door asking you to invite him into your life, to forgive you of your sins so that you may have eternal life. He's providing the way, pardon my spirit, but he's providing the way for you to get to God the Father. That's right. It doesn't matter how many doors you knock on. It won't get you to heaven. I don't care if your name is on the roll of Journey Baptist Church. That alone will not get you to heaven. I don't care if you've been dunked in the water. That will not get you to heaven. And might I say this kindly, I don't care how much money you put in the plate. And I know I'm the business guy, so that sounds crazy. But I don't care how much money you put in the plate. It will not get you to heaven. No matter how good you are, you'll never be good enough to outweigh the sin in your life. That, my dear friends, is the truth. There is one way to heaven. Through the truth, Jesus Christ. So the truth is we need Jesus. But here's another truth that some might find a little convenient. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He is to be worshipped. Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 11, or through 11, say, Wherefore God has also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and in things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. That right there tells you that Jesus is to be worshipped. That's the truth. But I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 1. The book of Hebrews chapter 1. I want us to look at the first four verses. We know that Jesus is to be worshipped. Why do we worship Jesus? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had said by himself, purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. This right here tells us why we should be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. For number one, he owns everything. You ever thought about that? He owns it all. It's his. It's not yours, it's not mine, it's his. He owns it all. But here's the other thing. He made it all. <laughs> he created everything. You look outside, you see the trees, he created those. You look at the ground and the grass, you say how beautiful it is. He created that. You look at places like Grand Canyon and all these uh, Niagara Falls, all these beautiful wonders. He created every single bit of it. But they pale in comparison to the glory that we'll find in heaven. But God created everything. Jesus was a part of that creation. Why? Right? Because he's God. The Bible tells us in the book of John that all things were created by him. And that nothing was created apart from him everything. He made it all. So he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship because he reflects the complete radiance of God's glory. 
He says right here, who being in the brightness of his glory, he expresses the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of God being an express image of his person. In verse 3 again, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And he continues to sustain all things. Continuing in verse 3, and upholding all things by the word of his power. You ever thought about that? Everything is held together. It's sustained by the word of his power. Can you imagine? This earth rotates on an axis at just the right speed. And it's held on this axis in just the right angle to sustain life. It doesn't tilt, it doesn't change, it doesn't go so fast we spin off, it doesn't go so slow we burn up. It continually maintained and sustained by the power of His Word. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship because He paid the price for our sins. It said, who being the brightness of His glory and the express of His image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He has sat down by Himself, purged our sins. And he rules it all. He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. These are the reasons why we worship. He owns it all. He made it all. He is the glory of God. He is the person of God. He purged us of our sins. And now he reigns over us. That, my dear friends, is the truth. That's why we worship him. Because he is the truth. And I want to give you a third thing today. Our worship, and this is part that some will not like. They'll find it to be a bit inconvenient. Our worship should bring him honor. It should bring honor to him. And here's the part that people don't like. We are told in the Bible that he's worthy of our worship, that we should worship him. We looked in Philippians, we looked at Hebrews. But we need to understand what it means to worship him if we want to do it correctly. What does the Bible mean by worship? The word worship means to bow down, to prostrate oneself, to fall down, to make obeisance reference. And to make obeisance means a movement of the body expressing deep respect before a superior. And to prostrate oneself, it means to cast oneself face down on the ground in humility, adoration, or submission. So we have this idea about what worship should be. But the word worship means that we make reverence to someone greater than us. And anybody here think you're on the same level of God? You're sadly mistaken. He is greater than you. He is greater than me. And so we need to be showing him that reverence. And the idea that we fall down flat on our face before him in adoration, in humility, in submission. That's what we need to be doing. He is everything. We are nothing. He is the creator. We are the creation. He is the master. We are the servant. And I could go on and on and on. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. We are sinners. He is holy and righteous and perfect without sin. He's way up here. We're way down here. So yes, we need to worship him. And we need to worship him how he wants to be worshipped. The problem is, worship is easily corrupted. It's easily corrupted. And we stop asking God, what is it you want from us? How do you want us to worship? And we offer God how we want to worship. We expect God to accept 
our form of worship. For some, they think by the fact that they're sitting in a pew this morning, it's with worship. That's good enough for God. I showed up. I sacrificed my time. There are some that think because I put money in the plate, I've sacrificed, therefore I'm worshiping and God has to accept it. Because we sing a few songs, God has to accept it. Might I remind you of the story of Cain and Abel, found in Genesis chapter 4. They both made a sacrifice to worship God, but God rejected Cain's sacrifice while he accepted Abel's sacrifice. What was the difference? See, one came out of a heartfelt desire and out of faith to worship God. It was pure. It was genuine. While the other one said, I have no faith. God, you will accept what I give you based on my terms. That's why God rejected it. That's why God rejected it. See, worship is not about what we want. It's about what God wants. And when we come to him in worship, it should be how he desires to be worshipped, not how we desire to worship him. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. We've been studying that in Sunday school. And there's part of that verse that says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And the idea of seeking God's face is to be in his presence. It's a longing, an aching, a desire for pouring out from our heart to want to be with God. To worship him. Say, Lord, you're everything. You are true. You are genuine. That's what our desire and worship should be. Unfortunately, unfortunately, today in our churches, throughout America, we've moved away from this idea of seeking God's face, of having genuine worship for God. And what we're looking to do is worship God on our terms. What feels good to me? And God, you have to accept it. Better be careful with that. Because just as God rejected Cain's worship, he can reject ours. And this is where the idea comes in about the entertainment value that's found in the worship. And I'm not here to attack it. I'll get into this in a minute. But I want to show you what Warren Wiersbe wrote. He said, true worship is something we must learn from God himself. For he alone has the right to lay down the rules for approaching him and pleasing him in worship. Did you get that? If we want to worship God, then we have to learn from God himself how he desires to be worshipped. Because he, and he alone, has the right to determine how worship should be. And some of the biggest arguments that we have in here is, oh, this is how the worship service ought to go. We want this type of music or that type of music. We want this kind of preaching or that kind of preaching. We want to have entertainment. You know, there's the idea. That's the modern thing that's going on right now, sweeping the churches, this idea of having churches for our entertainment value. So we want the light shows. We want the music that's entertaining. We want a preacher that's not a preacher. We want a comedian. Somebody that just tickles our funny bone. Tells those nice stories. You know, but this is not a new problem. This is not just something that's happened in the last few years. This is a tactic that Satan has used from the beginning of time. Charles Spurgeon wrote about this in the 1800s. And he says this, With unsuitable bounds, recreation is necessary and profitable. 
that it never was the business of the Christian church to supply the world with amusements. Our mission, however, is not to entertain the world, it is to save sinners through the preaching of the gospel. The world will provide entertainment and amusements enough. The greater the push toward entertainment and amusement, the lesser the imperative of the gospel will truly be felt as imperative. The preaching of Christ usually ceases when these frivolities come in. And you see that in these churches that are out there. They put more emphasis on the entertainment and keeping people thrilled and excited. And they take the preaching and they water it down. But why? Because they don't want the truth out there because people don't want to hear it. It's not convenient. It's not entertaining. Does anybody in here like being called a sinner? No. We don't want to hear that. You know what we want? We want to hear about love and peace and puppy dogs and molly pops and all that kind of stuff. But that will not get you to heaven. In order to get to heaven, you have to recognize that you are a sinner in need of salvation. And there's one way, and that's the truth. It's not about being entertained. It happened in the early 1900s. A.W. Tozer railed against it. And if you think that there aren't pastors today, prominent pastors, preaching against it today, you are wrong. Can I share with you a little something from Dr. David Jeremiah? I'm sure you've all heard the name. He's well respected. This is what Dr. Jeremiah had to say. The church is coming under attack. It is forgotten what the church is supposed to be. We are not an entertainment service. We're not here to see how close we can get to what the world does, but there's so much of the world in the church, and vice versa, that we can't tell a difference. He goes on to say that many churches are abandoning the traditional elements of the worship service in order to attract younger people. But he believes that it's contributing to the number of people leaving the church. And based on what he's seen, he believes that the younger people are still hungry for the core of the Christian faith. And he said in many respects, young people are demanding more truth, more teaching, and less entertainment. They're not interested in shallow expressions of religion. So we do all of these things, we compromise, and we become worldly because we're trying to bring people in. We've started to worship the number. See, I want to see the pews fell. I do. But not just because I want to see the pews fell. Uh, we can do all kinds of things. We can offer a raffle. We can offer give money away every week. We can get the pews packed. But it's not worship. We want to worship in truth. We want to see people's lives changed. People coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Getting to heaven and growing. That's how we want to grow a church. And believe it or not, I know I've heard people say, well, we need this type of music to get people in the church. Or we need this. Or we need programs. People are not buying it anymore. You know what they want? They want truth. They want truth. They want to see us being genuine. There's nothing around, but worse than coming in and being around people that are just, they give you that fake smile. So good to see you today. And you know they don't mean it. And there's nothing worse than coming up in here and people <coughs> say something like, well, if you just turn your life over to God, God's going to bless you and make you a multi-millionaire. You'll never be sick again a day in your life. All your problems will go away. That's a lie. Look around. I can tell you this. I got saved at the age of nine. I've had health issues. I've had times where I didn't have two nickels to rub together. I've had a house I lived in that was falling apart, had a hole in the floor, roof leaking, bathtub about to go through the floor, among other things. I've had people stab me in the back. I've had people lie to me. I've had family turn on me. I've had all kinds of problems. Just like you do. Just like every one of you. And guess what? We still have those problems. Jesus never said, I'll take your problems away. 
You don't believe it. You look at the, Paul, the life of Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's a perfect example. You think he wasn't a godly man? When he came to know Christ as his Savior, he's responsible. God used him to write most of the New Testament. He reached people in the gospel. But you look at what he went through. He was beaten. He was stoned. He was whipped, imprisoned, shipwrecked, snake bed. Go on and on and on. God never stopped it from happening to him. But what did God do? He stayed with him every step of the way. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And if God says it, it's true. It's true. Because God cannot lie. That's a fact. That's a fact. So the truth is, you may never be rich. Shocker, right? <laughs> but here's another side of it. That doesn't mean you won't be rich. God blessed Abraham. God blessed Job. God blessed Jacob. They had riches. But that may not be God's will for you, but it may be. But what God does for you, God may not do for you. What God allows you to go through, God may not allow you to go through. And it's all the same with me. But God is sovereign. He knows what he's doing. We just trust God. We trust God. But what we're seeing today is an abandonment of the worship that God wants. And we're replacing it with worship that we want. What's pleasing to the flesh. And God's rejecting our worship. Whether you like it or whether you don't, that is the truth. I want to wrap this up. I want you to turn to the book of John, chapter 4. Very quickly, John chapter 4. Verses 23 and 24. <coughs> Look at John chapter 4, verse 23. It says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we talk about worshiping God in spirit and truth. He said the true worshipers will do this, and that's who he's seeking. But we know who the truth is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. So we worship in the name of Jesus. But what's he mean by worshiping in the spirit? Well, before we came to know Christ, we were dead in trespasses and sin. We were spiritually dead. The moment we accept Christ, our spirits are quickened. They're made alive. And now it's the very depths of our soul. The spirit is there. So he's saying, if we want to worship him, truly worship him in truth, then there will be an outpouring from the bottom, the depths of our soul to him. And it doesn't matter the type of music. It doesn't matter what we, it's what God wants that matters to us. And that is the truth. Would you stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. We'll ask our men to come up and get ready to, pray, uh, to play. My question for you today here is very simple, simply this. If you're here and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you were to die today, if you don't know that you would go to heaven, won't you come forward and let me take my Bible and show you the way, the truth, and the life. 